Right, I'm reading from Genesis, and it's chapter 21, and I'm starting from the very first verse, and it's actually headed up the birth of Isaac. But then, as you can see, it's going to go on to hearing about Hagar and Ishmael being sent away. So here we go from verse 1. Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah, as he had said he would be, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age, at the very time God had promised him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him. When his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him, just as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old, and his son Isaac was born to him. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter, and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. And then she added, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. The child grew and was weaned, and on the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. But Sarah saw that the son whom Hagar the Egyptian had borne to Abraham, she was mocking. And so Sarah said to Abraham, Get rid of that slave woman and her son, for that slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. The matter distressed Abraham greatly, because it concerned his son. But God said to him, Do not be disheartened about the boy and your maidservant. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you. Because it's through Isaac that your offering, your, your offering will be reckoned, your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of his maidservant into a nation, also because he is also your offspring. Well, early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water, and he gave them to Hagar. He set them on her shoulders, and then he sent her off with the boy, and they went off their way, and they wandered into the desert of Beersheba. When the water in the skin had gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and she sat down nearby, about a bow shot away. She was thinking, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there near the boy, she began to cry, sob. God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven. And the angel said to her, What's the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard, he's heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up, take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water, and she gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert, and he became an archer. While he was living in the desert of Paran, his mother got a wife for him from Egypt. Amen. So I share with you some thoughts about where is God in the desert places. You know, the story of Hagar and Ishmael is one of pain and promise. It's a story of the pain of family breakdown, separation and abandonment. But it's also the story of the promise-keeping, merciful God. Sadly, it's often overlooked in favour of the retelling of the promised birth of Isaac. The comfortable family setting of Abraham, Sarah and Isaac makes for an easier read. And the part of the story that we're looking at today where Abraham casts out his servant woman and her son, 
raises difficult questions for us. Ishmael was also Abraham's son. How could God allow him to be treated in this way? We need to remember firstly that God had also made promises concerning the future of Ishmael. He had assured Abraham that he would make a nation from both of his sons. And remembering that God is a God who keeps his promises will help us in our understanding of this passage. You know, abandonment and rejection are not popular themes to look at. Yet there are crucial lessons to be taken from this story that can help us when we face our own desert places. Those times where we feel pushed out and left to struggle on our own. And the first point to make is this. When we feel in the middle of a desert, God hears our cries. Rejected, cast out, helpless, left to wander in an arid desert. You know, God's comforting presence must have felt a very long way from Hagar and Ishmael. Where was God in all this? Feelings of deep loneliness, confusion and bitterness must have been filling Hagar's mind. How could she possibly provide for the needs of her son out in the middle of this hostile land? And so came the tears. The tears of a defeated and desperate mother, the tears of a frightened, thirsty child. It's at this point in the story that comes the verse of hope. God heard the boy crying. Isn't it interesting that it was Ishmael's cries that God heard? Out in the middle of a vast wilderness, God heard the sobs of a small boy. Well, they tell us, don't they, that the 999 emergency system is state-of-the-art. All you need to do is call those, press those numbers and you'll instantly be connected to a dispatcher. You will have a readout in front of them that lists your telephone number and address. Often a caller might not be able to say what the problem is. Sometimes because of pain or fear, the person is so out of control that all they can do is hysterically scream into the telephone. But the dispatcher doesn't need any more. He knows where the call is coming from, and help is already on its way. There are times in our lives when in our desperation and pain, we dial 999 prayers. Sometimes we're hysterical. Sometimes we don't know the words to speak. Sometimes all we can do is cry. But if we believe the passage of scripture that we've just heard read, then we have to believe that God hears our cries. He knows our name. He knows our circumstance. His help is already on the way. The next thing for us to remember is that when we feel as if we're in the middle of a desert, God provides. God provides. You know, a vase was found closely sealed in a mummy pit in Egypt by the traveller Wilkinson. He sent it to the British Museum, but the librarian had the misfortune to drop it and break it. Can you imagine? Poor thing must have been so mortified. But from the ruins, he managed to gather a few peas. They were old, 
withered and dry as stones. However, he sprinkled them with water and had them carefully planted under a glass on the 4th of June, 1844. And then he waited. At the end of 30 days, they had sprouted and were growing well. They'd been buried as dead for nearly 3,000 years and yet were brought to life by some drops of water. Well, we read that before Hagar left, she had been given a skin, a leather skin full of water. And this is what um, they looked like then. And both of them would, of course, have known that this wasn't going to be able to last them very long in the desert. But it would have been all she was able to carry. And the only hope of survival that they had was to stumble across a source of water within the desert itself, a well or an oasis. And with this not being very likely, it would have come as no surprise when this skin ran dry. She was going to have to tell her son that there was no more water. She was going to have to take the decision to stop. Put Ishmael under the shade of a bush and wait for the inevitable. I wonder if any of us have ever felt as desperate as Hagar. So defeated that we've not even bothered to call for help, but just accepted our lot and prepared to face the consequences. Maybe there's been a bitter family separation, a painful divorce, or perhaps we've even found ourselves in the situation of Hagar faced of not knowing how we were going to meet the needs of our family. For many of us, there's been that time, that period in our lives where we've just not been able to cope anymore. And we've desired simply to sit and wait for the inevitable. The promises to us and to our family have been long forgotten. The wonderful thing about this biblical passage is that it was when Hagar had reached this state of total despair that she knew God's intervention. He chose to remind her of the future that he had prepared for her and her son. By the visitation of an angel, God reassured Hagar and made her remember the promise that through Ishmael, God would make a great nation. It was at the point of her greatest need that he gently extends his mercy. Isn't that wonderful to know? Whatever our experiences have been, take hope this morning. As you hear these words, then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. You know, miracles can happen in all sorts of places and at all sorts of times. God providing for us at our point of need is no less a miracle than God turning water into wine or producing a spring out of the desert sand. The miracle is that God chooses to reach down and intervene. He chooses to provide life-giving water for our dry and thirsty souls. And just like those peas that sprang to life after 3,000 years of dryness, so we can experience the refreshing rain of God's mercy. If only we let him open our eyes and see what miracle he's placed in front of us.
the last point I want to bring out from this passage is that when we feel as if we're in the middle of a desert, God stays at our side. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the uh, Russian dissident, was working 12 hours a day at hard labor. He'd lost his family. He'd been told by doctors that he had terminal cancer. And one day he thought to himself, there is just no use going on. I'm going to die soon anyway. And ignoring the guards, he dropped his shovel. He sat down and he rested his head in his hands. he felt a presence next to him. And he looked up and he saw an old man that he'd never seen before. And the man took a stick and drew a cross in the sand. It reminded Solzhenitsyn that there is a power in this world that is greater than any empire or government a power that could bring new life into any situation, even his. He picked up his shovel and he went back to work. A year later, Solzhenitsyn was unexpectedly released from jail. Here was someone who felt as desperate as Hagar Someone willing to give up and die. But the turning point came for him when he was reminded that God had not abandoned him. And so it was with Hagar and with Ishmael. God was with the boy as he grew up. Such a simple little verse, but one that holds so much comfort. God didn't just provide for the immediate needs of Hagar and Ishmael and then leave them to get on with things. We read that he stayed with them, that he continued in his care throughout Ishmael's formative years. And this story has a happy ending, as it were. We see the saving of Ishmael and his mother right through to his eventual marriage. God's intervention in their lives was continuous. He stayed with them, caring for them, providing for their needs, for the needs of these outcasts that everyone else seemed to have forgotten. It does us good to remember that God's heart is for the outcast. It always has been. It's to such people as Hagar and Ishmael that God chooses time and time again to extend his mercy. And although God rescued this pair, left abandoned in the desert, you know, he didn't just lift them out of their situation and make everything better. Hagar and Ishmael must have faced many hard years together surviving on their own, struggling to come to terms with life without Abraham. God didn't just simply transport them back, heal the family rift, but he did stay with them. He did stay at their side. Our experience is often similar. We find that in our darkest moments, God doesn't always choose to take away our pain. He doesn't always choose to remove us from traumatic situations. Often we have to live in it. But he always, always stays with us. God never leaves us or forsakes us. He never abandons us to cope on our own. There wouldn't be much hope for us if he did. When we need him the most, he is right next to us, drawing a cross in the sand. A reminder of the fact that he loved us so much that he gave us his only son to come and rescue us. Reminding us that he doesn't Consider our feelings of pain and rejection lightly. But he chose to do something about them. 
by sending us his son. For Jesus came to bind up the brokenhearted, to set free the oppressed, to proclaim good news to the poor. It was to the abused, the hurt, the rejected, the downtrodden, that Jesus came to love and liberate. Jesus' heart, just like his father's, is for the outcast. And it's the same for us today. This very morning, Jesus longs to heal and restore, to wipe away our tears and to sprinkle his refreshing water of life onto dry stones and simply remind us that he's always with us. I'm going to invite the band forward. And we're just going to spend a moment quietly thinking and reflecting on what we've just heard. Now, I don't know where all of you are at in your lives at the moment, but the Lord God does. And he hears your cries. He knows your heart. And I want to say to you this morning that he is with you, that he is the promise-keeping God, and we know that he works for the good of those that love him, and that he doesn't take our struggles lightly. He doesn't not see our pains, our frustrations, our difficulties, our challenges. He is with us and he sustains us and he strengthens us. And whenever we feel ready, we're going to sing together a song that really sums up what I want you to take with you this morning and that's the goodness of God. That even through the desert places, God is good. And we don't stay in the desert forever. We do come out. It just doesn't feel like it when we're going through it. (laughs) But God does lead us through. And he is good.